I need to do some like setup and some warnings before we jump into the topic. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I derailed the schedule again this semester. I had to do it last semester too because I got so many requests to do this talk. The topic today is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising takes place in World War II. I'm doing a World War II lecture series. I'm in 1919, I haven't even gotten to World War II in the lecture series. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is 1943. So I'm really pulling this, like I'm completely derailing, but I just wanted to make people happy and, and we'll go from there. Um, so that's, uh, that's why I'm derailing things a little bit. So when I post this online, I'll have World War II Part X <laughs> until I get to that point in the lecture series in 2033. And then I'll, then I'll know where it lands in the sequence. Um, so, so that's one warning. Another warning is this is a heavy, depressing topic. Like if you keep, if you're listening and you're waiting for me to make this somehow a little bit better by the time we get to the end, that's not gonna happen. So, uh, you know, take care of your emotions. Uh, I, I have had moments where, you know, as a person who's focused on history and constantly talking about current events and stuff that happened in the past, I've had moments where I just fatigued out. And so if you find yourself needing to get up, take a break, just, you just wanna leave and never come back, do it. Just make sure you're, you know, being true to yourself. Um, and that, of course, goes, because this will be recorded, right? This go, that, of course, goes for the people watching later. So I just want you to know it's impossible to sugarcoat this. I'm t doing this talk in part because it is horrible. Um, it's probably a terrible way to start the semester. <laughs> but maybe we'll spend the rest of the semester trying to make it less horrible. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then what I need to do, because I haven't built up all the World War II stuff is I need to do background. So I am going to have to start with a little bit of background. So at some point I might have another video that has a little bit of redundancy, but it, it'll be okay. Redundancy is good for learning purposes. So there's a few moving pieces that I want to set up, but before I do, I also want to clarify something that a lot of people get confused with, and it makes total sense to get confused with. There was a Warsaw Uprising. The topic tonight is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. There are two different events. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a conversation with a person who knows a lot about World War II and they get them mixed up. So if you've gotten them mixed up, you can't feel bad about it. They're both in Warsaw. They're 16 months apart. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising takes place in April and May of 1943. The Warsaw Uprising takes place in August and September of 1944. So they are very different in, in, in the way they rolled out, but very similar in name and timing. So it's easy to get them confused. I'll do the brief nutshell version of the Warsaw Uprising, just so that you can see the contrast. Uh, what happened was the Polish resistance, which called itself the Home Guard. It was a very well-organized, hard-fighting force. Um, it decided that it didn't really want to be under Soviet control post-World War II. And I mean, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know that that Soviet army that's pushing the Germans back, heading to Berlin, that has to go through Poland to get to Berlin, isn't probably going to let Poland make its own future post-World War II. So what the Home Guard decided to do was launch an uprising as the Soviet army was approaching to, to grab Warsaw and liberate it from German control so that by the time the Soviet army got there, the Poles would have some negotiating space. Right? They're still gonna have to deal with this massive Soviet army and it's not like they're friends, <laughs> but at least they will have captured the capital of their country first. So as the Soviet army was approaching, the Poles went into an uprising. The Soviet army stopped and waited. And they gave the Germans the opportunity to go into Warsaw and slaughter the Polish uprising. Once the Polish uprising was put down by the Nazis, 
the Soviet army picked up and began moving again. In other words, the Soviets knew exactly why the, the Warsaw Uprising was taking place, and they didn't want the Poles to have a position to negotiate with. So they let their enemy take care of the problem for them, and then they liberated Poland. All right, that's not what we're talking about tonight. I just want to get that out of the way so that you could have the contrast in your mind what the two events are. Before I jump into the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, I need to lay the groundwork for anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, nationalism, the rise of the Nazis. So let me do a little bit of that at least, get it going. So <clears throat> to do that though, I need to define a term. And the term I need to define, well, I need to define at least two, anti-Semitism and, and nationalism. Let me start with nationalism. So <clears throat> most people get a little confused with nationalism because they conflate it with patriotism. So there are two different things, to be clear. Patriotism is the love of a country. So for example, if I said I was a Texas patriot, I, I'm just saying I really like Texas. Now, it, it could be that I'm so loyal to Texas, I'd be willing to die for it and kill for it. Like, let's say somebody attacked Texas, Nebraska or somebody. Well, I'd be willing to shoot Nebraskans to defend Texas, maybe. I might even be willing to jump on a hand grenade to defend Texas. That's what a, a Texas patriot would be. That doesn't mean it's exclusive. In other words, if I say I'm a Texas patriot and I'm willing to die for Texas, that doesn't mean I hate Mexico. That doesn't mean I hate New Mexico, for that matter. It doesn't mean I even hate Nebraska. I kind of do, but for different reasons. It's not... It's not because of some sort of Texas loyalty. There's nothing about patriotism that necessarily requires you to dislike something else. You don't have to have that contrast. In the spring, I see the blue bonnets. It makes me happy. I get dizzy with joy, and I want to love the place that I live in while I'm stuffing brisket into my mouth for breakfast or whatever it is that I do. Uh, I didn't bring... I should have worn my cowboy boots today. So... I messed up. Anyway, if I had thought about it, a nationalist is a different creature completely. Like, as in, it's the difference between water and the planet Mars. They're not even kind of the same. A nationalist is a person who loves their nation, not their country. The, the, the patriot is, it's a land thing. The nationalist, it's a people thing. So first, we have to figure out the, the nation. So a nation is, some of you know this definition, a nation is a group of people who have five things in common. The most important thing is a common identity. And then after that, probably you want to have a common language, although I can think of all sorts of examples of cases where you don't. And then after that, in no particular order, common history, common DNA, common traditions. That's what makes a nation. People from the same nation tend to look alike. They tend to listen to, the similar, to similar music. They probably speak the same language, but not necessarily. And their ancestors went through a series of really horrific, violent events together that brought them together and went, we should really identify as a group. Boom, done. A nationalist doesn't just say, I love my nation. A nationalist says, I think my nation is superior to all other nations. What a nationalist does is they say, by virtue of my birth and my culture, you're inferior to me. Because if I'm superior to you, that means you're inferior to me. And so one of the problems is, how do you define exactly what the nation is? What are the boundaries on this? One of those problems is a cultural one, right? So let's say your nation has a tendency to shoot itself. Like you just, as a pastime, instead of hunting deer, you hunt each other. Well, that's a tough one to make, make right in your mind, but a nationalist will figure out how to make it right. Yeah, those other guys are weak. They don't have this Darwinian sense of we need to shoot each other to weed out the weaklings. 
right? Because the, what the nationalist does is they think of their nation as perfect and special and better and chosen by God. And as a result, because everyone else is inferior, when you think about it, killing everyone else is just making the world a better place because you're just getting rid of the weak, bad nations. In other words, nationalism lends itself really quickly to a sense of, is genocide really bad? Is it though? And, and that's, that's the danger with nationalism. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, nationalism has been around forever. Not really, not in the sense that we use it today in the modern world. It really started about 100, 220 or so years ago. What happened was Napoleon Bonaparte figured out how to harness the power of nationalism. So he had a problem, and this wasn't a small problem, this was a big problem. He had been elected dictator of, of the Republic of France to get the revolution to stop. They had had this glorious, amazing revolution. They did these really wonderful things in it. Like they changed their artwork, they changed the names of the months, they deleted the Catholic Church, they switched to metric. <laughs> the first country on earth to switch to metric. Like, that's genius. They did these really insane, incredible things, but they couldn't turn the revolution off. So at some point, what we needed to do, we may have to have somebody go do jumping jacks over there because the motion detector has decided there's nobody over there. Uh, so if somebody wants to volunteer and go activate the motion detector. Um, so thank you. Uh, so what happened was, we were in this, the French are in this revolution, they can't turn it off. So the, they would get up in front of everybody, they go, we won, you don't have to do revolution anymore. Once, the, once you've replaced the other government and brought in the new government, it's over, stop revolting. And the people are like, revolution! And they go set something on fire and kill, guillotine somebody. And the government's like, yeah, yeah, but we're the revolutionary government, you don't have to do revolution anymore. We're what you wanted, you got what you wanted. It's over, let's settle down now. We need you back in the factories making shoes and in the farms making wheat. And then they'd be like, revolution, and set something else on fire and guillotine another person. What Napoleon realized was if he could take that revolutionary fervor, direct it with nationalism, he could invade Italy. So he gets up in front of the French people and he goes, do you know how it is that we pulled off this glorious, amazing revolution? You're French. That makes you superior to everybody else on the planet. It is your duty as French people to export the revolution to those inferior nations because they'd never be able to pull something off so glorious on their own. And the next thing you know, those revolutionaries are wearing a military uniform marching into Italy. And then the next thing you know, Napoleon goes on a 17 year long rampage. He does capture Moscow. <laughs> And he, so as a result, he owned everything from Madrid to Moscow at one point. But that's one of the crazy things about nationalism. It's like cancer, it spreads. And so here's why. When Napoleon marches through Germany, the Germans had a sense of nationalism. So as the Germans, as the French are marching through Germany, the Germans are looking at the French army going, oh, if we only had that, that sense of superiority, and then they watch them retreat back out, and then they'd watch them invade back in. 17 years of watching the French army running around Europe going, oh. And it takes a long time for German nationalism to actually take hold. And in fact, there's a revolution of 1848, and in the revolution of 1848, they do, there is a nationalist movement in that revolution in Germany. And the goal is to eventually at some point create a German state, a single German entity. And they do succeed in the end. 1871, the United States of America is 95 years older than Germany. So just to put it into perspective, Germany is the new kid on the block. That nationalism 
that they finally do harness, that they finally do get going, is going to, of course, become toxic. But not just to Germany. Name a country on the planet right now that isn't in the midst of some kind of weird nationalist thing. It's creepy. I have bad news for you. We are all equally worthless. Chill. Let's just try to make the best of it. But anyway, fine, whatever. So, <clears throat> by the end of the 1800s, by the end of the 19th century, those German nationalists who are dreaming big, who are thinking that Germany needs to become something great, like Great Britain-style great, are also dealing with some problems. And one of the problems is, what is it exactly that defines the German nation? And by the way, you can do this for everybody, right? Like if you're an Indian nationalist, what defines being Indian? If you're a Hungarian nationalist, what defines being Hungarian? How do you figure that out? Is it the food? Like paprikash, they use capsicum, capsicum as in a plant from North America, not native to Hungary. That's weird. Is it marinara? Uses tomatoes, nightshade, related to capsicum, also from North America, not native to Italy. What is it? So it's not the food, because you just imported a bunch of ingredients from North America, it turns out. So there must be some in the last 500 years. So there must be something else. Is it that you're punctual or you're not punctual? Yeah, we never make it on time. It's a good thing we don't run nuclear power plants. <laughs> is, that, like, is that your defining feature? You're a little violent. You like to dance by jumping in the air. What is it that makes it so that you have your national identity? Or you dance like the Irish and you don't move your arms, but you move the hell out of your feet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what is it? What is it that makes you that nation? And here's the problem. If we were to pretend we're all in the same nation right now for a moment, we'd have different tastes. There would be things that would separate us, even if you were in the same nation. Like if you grabbed 100 Germans and put them in the same room, there are Germans who don't do the same things as the other Germans. The nations aren't homogenous because people aren't homogenous because people have different personalities, different tastes. And from area to area, there's going to be regional differences in traditions. And so this idea of the nation is a really strange one when you think about it. When Italy formed in 1860, 20% of the country spoke Italian. Of course, today it's 90-something percent. But one of the things that the, the Italian state, the Kingdom of Italy, had to do was get rid of the other Italian languages, like Venetian, like Sicilian and replace it with Italian. So they had, to, they had to convince people to stop speaking their form of Italian and start speaking the new form of Italian. Germany had to do the same thing. 25% of Germany spoke Hochdeutsch. So one of the things they had to do is get rid of the Plattdeutsch speakers. They didn't succeed, Plattdeutsch is still spoken, but at the end of the day, Hochdeutsch has become the national language. Language is almost easy because you could just make it so that your news is in that language, so that your schools are in that language. And you could just sort of force people to kind of go along. Well, kind of. In the Arab world, the news is in classical Arabic. Nobody speaks classical Arabic. So people know what's being said to them. <laughs> and journalists have to learn the language so that they can speak on the airwaves. But then the public is like, I, I can't speak it back. It didn't work in the Arab world, but in some places it has worked. So, <clears throat> language is kind of easy, but what about the rest of this stuff? How do you define? You know, especially when you have a cultural problem like you're really similar to the other culture. So do this as an exercise once, if you get the chance. Go to Turkey and Greece. Go to Turkey, Greece, and Iran. Just try to tell everybody apart. Like guess, randomly guess. Are you a Kurd? Are you Persian? Are you Azeri? Are you Turkish? Are you Greek? Just do that, but always make sure you're guessing wrong. Just 
and watch people react. I'm not a Greek. What? You're like, I can't tell you apart. And then look at the foods they're eating. Is this Persian food? Is this Turkish food? Is this Greek food? Really? Really? All three of you invented it at the same time? This can't be all three of you. But, the, but right? That's exactly what it is. So you line them up, you can't tell them apart. You eat their foods, you can't tell them apart. So then, how do I define myself? Here's how you do it. It's impossible to define yourself as a nation. So you define yourself by what you're not. And it can be true or false, it doesn't matter. It can be completely imaginary. Oh, we're not X, they are. Boom. This is the act of otherizing. So to do this Turkish Greek thing, we're not Turks, we're Greeks. We're not Greeks, we're Turks, right? <laughs> How do you know, first of all, like is the language you spoke? So I had, I, I knew two Greeks when I was living in Vermont, lovely people. We'd go out to, have, my wife and I'd go out to have lunch with them and we'd talk. And I like to talk culture with them. So finally one day I said, I'm ready to ask you this difficult question. And they go, okay. So 200 years ago, when your ancestors went, we're Greek, how did they know they weren't Turks? And they both burst into laughter. They're both PhDs, they're both professors, they study culture. Right? They burst into laughter and they go, they didn't. And they go, then what happened? They go, they just picked. They just went, we're Greek, done. Boom. It's that simple. But by saying we're Greek, what they were also saying, and this was just as important, is we're not Turk. But where did that line land? That line was an arbitrary land in many cases. And when, when, when the Ottoman Empire finally ceased to exist, there were communities of Greeks living in what is today Turkey, and there were communities of Turks in what is today Greece. And like the Indian partition, they got up and swapped places. And it wasn't exactly peaceful. There was a lot of violence in this process. But in many cases, they had to pick. They had to sit down and go, I I actually don't know what I am. But when you're a nationalist, you can easily define what you are by what you're not. So Germany found itself in that weird situation where the nationalists were trying to figure out how to have an other, an other that they could hate, an other they could contrast themselves against. Right? Let me give you an example. It's, it's going to get me in trouble with people, but I like to get in trouble, so I'm okay with it. Which is more identity erasing? Being forced to cover your hair or changing your last name when you get married? It seems to me losing your name is way worse than wearing a hat when it comes time to eliminating a person's identity. Everybody I know in the United States changed their name when they got married, except for like two or three people. So for me, it's like 90 something percent. Why did your DNA change? Are you now related to that guy? That's weird. Isn't that incest? I think that's wrong. Did you really get sucked into that family? We'll see during your divorce if that's true or not. I bet it ain't. I actually know of cases where the divorced person ended up more closer to the family than the kid that was actually related. So it's possible. I'm not ruling it out. I'm just saying, probably against, it's stacked against that as the outcome. Now, don't get me wrong. I think forcing anybody to cover their hair is also wrong. I think forcing people to anything is wrong. You should let people come to it on their own. But I'm just asking the question. Because when we talk about hijab, we immediately villainize the hell out of the Middle East. Yet, we're not looking at our own sexism and our own identity-crushing events. Arab women don't change their name when they get married. 
because that would be weird. That would be an identity crushing event. So one of the things that we do with American nationalism is we're like, they're sexist. Our women are liberated. Are you? At the current rate, by the way, of uh, gender pay equality, um, Saudi Arabia will hit gender equality by the year 2100. The United States will hit it by 2200. They will beat us by a century. Saudi Arabia. You know the country you like to villainize all the time for being so sexist? We'll have gender pay equality a full century before us. At the end of the day, let's face it, monetary power is power. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? One of the things that we love to do, what nationalists love to do, is mask their flaws by finding flaws in others and go, well, at least we're not that. How many times have you been in a conversation with somebody and you brought up something the United States did that was wrong? So for example, genocide of Native Americans. And they go, well, but in World War II, the Nazis, really? You're comparing us to the Nazis? That's, that was your, that's where you went to? Like you didn't want to go for, I don't know, Britain first or something, or France, or just something a little gentler? I actually, for one, don't think the British were gentler than the Nazis, just for the record. But in the public perception, there is that false belief. Anyway. So, <clears throat> that's what nationalists do. Here are these German nationalists, and they decided they were going to go for Judenhass. Judenhass means Jew hatred. Judenhass. But as they were expanding upon Judenhass, coming up with reasons to hate Jews, they, were already, they already had a list, and then they had a history. And the history was the history of pogroms. So the first pogrom was 1096. What happened was the Crusader army, before it left Germany to go to the Middle East to tear it up and kill a million people over the course of 195 years, before that Crusader army took off, it decided it needed Jesus' blessings right there in Germany. So that Crusader army went up and down the Rhine River looking for Jewish communities. The estimate is that they murdered about 9,000 Jews, they raped thousands of Jewish women, and then they set off to the Middle East where they would then slaughter Muslims and Jews wholesale, time after time after time. But they needed to get it started. And they started it with a pogrom. So by the time we get to the 19th century, we're, we've got 800 years of pogrom history because anything, anytime anything went wrong in Europe, the European political leaders would go, the Jews. There's high inflation, the Jews, they did it. Uh, there was an earthquake, that was also Jewish. The Jews made the earthquake happen. And so the next thing you know, there's a pogrom where the, community people, the people in the community would just go to the Jewish part of town and beat up some Jews for a while or kill them and then vent their anger, and then the politicians would go, thank you. But it's the politicians that needed to be beaten up. That was their, well, not the earthquake, but cert certainly the inflation was their fault. And this was a way to deflect, deflect. So by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, those German nationalists are building on that, but they had a problem. Judenhass, Jew hatred, it sounds awful. Who wants that? It's an emotional thing. Hate, that's not rational. Rational people don't hate. Rational people, rational things. There's, there's no such thing as rationality, just for a record. <laughs> Funny though. We rationalize after we've made a decision, we come up with a crazy story that tries to make sense out of the irrational decision we made. And then we try to sell it to others. But that's not the same as rationality. So, <clears throat> they didn't like the term because it sounded too emotional. So they decided to come up with a new term, a term that would sound scientific. And the term they came up with was anti-Semitism. So Semites and Hamites are cultural linguistic groups. They were named after Sem and Ham or Shem and Ham, depending on how you're saying it. 
the, the two of Noah's sons. The Semites were the Asian group, the Hamites were the African group. So the ancient Egyptians, the Berbers, the Ethiopians, the Somalis, they're Hamites. So it's, think of North, the indigenous North African population. Arabs, Jews, uh, the Aramaic speakers, um, so like the Babylonians, um, Canaanites, Moabites, those populations, those were the Semites. And so when the Germans picked the term, the German practitioners of Judenhaus picked the term anti-Semitism, they actually included Arabs in the process because Arabs are Semites. H Hebrew and Arabic are shockingly similar languages. They're very closely related. Uh, I don't think they're quite as closely related as Aramaic is to Hebrew, but they're, they're very close. And so at that moment, there was this cultural inclusion, I think, that the, the German nationalists didn't necessarily want, intend to include, but at some level they did. Because here's one of the interesting things. All this anti-Jewish hate was intimately tied to anti-Muslim hate. This wasn't separated out nicely and neatly. For example, in Spain, Judaism was banned in Spain in 1492 a year that a bunch of stuff happened at the same time. 1492 is a huge year. It's also, it also happens to be the year that the Kingdom of Granada fell to Castile and Leon, to Isabella. That's why Judaism was outlawed in that year. Because as long as there was a Muslim-controlled territory in Spain, there was a place for Jews to flee to, there was a, there was a place to defend the Jews. So they need what the Christian fundamentalist fanatics who were making Spain needed to do was take out the last Muslim state before they could start to purge the, the, the peninsula of its Jewish population. Well, in other words, going after the Jewish population in Spain required you first to put down the last Muslim state. And then, 10 years later, Islam was banned. So when the Spanish Inquisition gets implemented, Here's the, the ironic twist. People will say, you know, how many Jews, how many Muslims were killed in the Spanish Inquisition? The answer is zero. Because the Inquisition only had the authority to determine whether or not Christians were practicing Christianity correctly. The people who were killed that you mean are Jewish and Muslim were Jewish and Muslim converts to the Catholic faith. The conversos were Jewish converts to Catholicism the Moriscos were the Muslim converts to Catholicism. That's what the Inquisition went after. And then it would show that secretly, oh, that person is still a Jew in their household. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to burn you to death. That's right. That's what Jesus would want for you right now. And it's our way of saving your soul. Oh, this person's secretly Muslim. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a really crazy way to kill you. How about the spike? We'll spike you on a wall slowly so you die over a course of a few days. That way, when you arrive at the pearly gates and you're judged, the heaven will go, you've already suffered so much, we don't need you to burn in hell. Wasn't that kind of those priests? It's very kind, very thoughtful. They weren't torturing you to be cruel to you. They were torturing you to try to save your soul. Very kind, very loving, very caring, <clears throat> very thoughtful. In fact, to keep it in Spain for just a second, there's another twist. Our colorism comes out of this moment as well. In other words, not only is anti-Jewish hatred linked intimately to anti-Muslim hatred, but so is anti-black racism. Because this new fundamentalist Christian state that's become Spain has to figure out how it establishes the hierarchy. And in its mind, the hierarchy is that you're pure Christian or purer Christian, unless you have fewer Muslim ancestors, fewer Jewish ancestors. So what they concluded was the lighter your skin color, the purer Christian ancestry you had, the darker your skin color, the more Muslim and Jewish ancestry you had. And that's where the term white came from, with whiteness being the, your aspired goal. You wanted to die so that you're, you could be really white, because right, 
If you've ever seen a dead white person, they're really, really, really white. That's your goal. Because then at that moment, you've proven to everybody you have very little Jewish and Muslim ancestry. So in that moment, then, Europe has this race thing that it's just concocted. Now, for sure, there was always something like a bias towards a group, but it was never framed that way. This is a new thing that pops up. So in this moment, there are these moving parts, but there's something else that's going on at the same time. And that is that the way that we see history is reframed. So there's a guy named Hieronymus Wolf. So I can't believe I Americanized it. Hieronymus Wolf. <laughs> anyway, I said Wolf. I'm so embarrassed. Hieronymus Wolf. What he did was, he, it drove him nuts how the Roman Empire collapsed. The Roman Empire fell May 29, 1453 to the Ottoman Empire. Well, the Ottoman Empire was Muslim. So the Roman Empire died just a couple of decades before Columbus sails the ocean blue to a Muslim empire. It drove him nuts. It drove Europeans nuts. At some level, they didn't care anymore. They, the Roman Empire was like this thing. It was like this wound. But at another level, it was this thing that white men, especially Christian white men, are super crazy obsessed with. And for centuries, it isn't just a recent phenomenon on TikTok, but it is also that now too. It's this thing that's been around forever. And so there was this wound, this festering, painful reminder of the glory of that Rome was no longer, that gets put down by this Muslim empire. And so what Hieronymus Wolf does, he comes up with a clever scam. He's going to trick the world. On September 4, 476 AD, the emperor, Romulus Augustus, the Western Roman emperor, took off his robes, his purple robes, put it in a box, called in FedEx, had FedEx ship it to Constantinople and with a note. And it said, there's no point in having two Roman emperors, Emperor Zeno. Why don't you be the only Roman emperor? So then what happens is Hieronymus Wolf goes, that's the moment the Roman Empire fell. The moment that it went from two emperors to one. <laughs> it didn't fall. It just deleted one of its emperors. And now it's a, it has a single emperor. And then it changed its flag a few decades later to a two-headed eagle because it's one empire with two heads because it's West and East combined. So the Roman Empire didn't fall. But then that way, he could take credit for the Roman Empire falling because he could say the Germanic tribesmen did it. Odovacar did it. The, it, was, it was actually a goth. Oh, that's so cool. The goths did it. They put on the makeup. They got real, uh, put on black clothes. And the next thing you know, Rome fell. It was very sad, very sad. That's why the weeping and the, the kind of always sad look that the Goths today have. Just, no, it's not funny. Just feel like it is. I'm pretty sure it's funny. So, uh, and then that way, the last thousand years of Roman history that ends in a Muslim defeat for the Roman Empire, Muslim victory over the Roman Empire, a defeat at the hands of Muslims, was the Byzantine Empire. He repackaged it. The Romans never called themselves the Byzantines. He made it up. These, are all, these pieces are all, all combined together in a really weird way to create a new narrative. A narrative that Europe was always on top. Europe was always great. It was Europeans who took out the Romans, not those terrible Muslim Middle Easterners who took out the Romans. In fact, when you think about it, it's really amazing. How is Anatolia not in, in Western civilization? How is Iraq and Egypt not in Western civilization? Those are the places where it was founded. Syria, those are, that's where Western civilization was born. So if anything, what the Europeans do is they pretend that they imported it, but they're the genuine thing. How can you be the genuine thing when you imported it? It would be like taking something made in China and stamping made in America on it and turning around and selling it to somebody. It's not right. It's still made in China. 
You just stamp Made in USA on it. All right. So this is, these are the pieces that are going, coming together in like the 1890s. Anti-Semitism, Judenhaas, anti-Muslim hate, r the racism that Europeans have been implementing in, first in the Americas, then in Africa, then in Asia, the colonial process, the fact that the, the Rudyard Kipling's idea of the white man's burden, that Christians were go, Christian white Europeans were going to these savage barbaric lands and teaching them civilization. That these were backwards people. Maybe they weren't terrible people. Maybe their culture could eventually evolve and flower into something else. But they were just so backwards, they needed a boost. And that's, that's the role of the white man, the white man's burden. Of course, Rudyard Kipling then made another poem later because right, he made all these poems, he, one of them, The White Man's Burden, which glorified the British Empire. And then World War I happens and his son dies in battle. And so then he writes a poem where he says, their fathers lied and then they died. And in other words, he reevaluated the stupidity of what he was saying in his original poetry. That's his real power, not his original poetry. It's the, the shock and dismay that he told these really bizarre lies, and his kid bought it and died for it. So, in the midst of all of this, it became really easy for the Germans to have this imaginary idea of what the Jews were, the German nationalists, to have this imaginary idea of what Jews were, and then build on that, and villainize them, and talk about how horrible they were, time after time after time. And any time anything went wrong, or you didn't like something, you'd blame it on them. Oh, Marx was a Jew. Technically, he had Jewish ancestry, but his, his parents converted to Christianity. He was actually raised as a Christian. They didn't care. He had Jewish culture, Jewish DNA. Because eventually, throw in Darwin now, and there's a new layer added to this mix. Well, if my nation is superior, and then we throw in Darwin, and Darwin's about survival of the fittest, then doesn't it only seem right that we should become selective about the types of DNA that we allow to exist in our nation? Doesn't it seem selective then that we should, we should actively seek to get rid of the weaklings? In 1901, the United States becomes the first place to start implementing eugenics laws. The state of Indiana implements the first eugenics laws in the modern period. And they, they established an IQ test and began I, IQ testing people and then the idea being that if you were on the low end of the spectrum, you would be removed from the gene pool by making it so it would be difficult for you to figure out a way to reproduce. And of course, these German nationalists are watching the United States going, oh, wow, isn't that a great idea? We can make a better race. And of course, once that gets into the, the conversation post-World War I, it turns into the conversation about a master race, a perfect race. Now, there's another piece. Hegel didn't mean for this, but Hegel did it anyway. What he said was that the way the world worked was it was a competition between nations. So if you take the, Rome, the Roman experience, there was a Roman Empire. It clashes with the Germanic tribesmen. The Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, the Franks, right? These different Germanic tribes, the Lombards, come crashing in to the Roman Empire. And it's a struggle. And both are changed in the process. It's not that the Germans eventually win and the Romans eventually lose. It's that the Germans become more like the Romans and the Romans become more like the Germans as they struggle against each other until there's a new thing and he calls that thing the synthesis. And then, he, and then every synthesis has a series of contradictions. And those contradictions are the other nations. And they struggle in a new conflict until they create a new synthesis. So first it's the, the Goths bring, create Odo Wacker, right? And uh, <clears throat> the, the subsequent Goths before the Lombards invade. 
And actually, before the Lombards invade, Rome tries to retake Italy, and it actually does. It captures Italy just as the Lombards are invading, and then Rome loses Italy again. How embarrassing to lose Italy if you're the Roman Empire. It's like, oh, just too much. It's like every time France lost to Germany. Um, so, because they'd lose France. It's so embarrassing. Ah, oh, crap, we lost France again. It's okay, we still have Vietnam. Uh, no, I think that's like really bizarre and weird. It's, so, <clears throat> that's what Hegel says propels fi history. Until the Germans realize their national aspirations. Because Hegel was a nationalist. He believed that the Germans were so close to being perfect culturally that there was no contradiction. And so as a result, history would end. Now, there is a group of dumb nationalist Germans who knew this. They couldn't understand Hegel. They couldn't read Hegel. But they still knew it. And they went, good enough for me. Let's end history. We will do a war, an epic war. That war will avenge World War I and our humiliating defeat that was caused by the Jews. And then we'll take the master race into a position where it can dominate the world. Nationalism had taken the Germans down this bizarre path where they began to believe this, but, it not, but just a small fraction of the population. There were two elections in 1932. The first one, the Nazis got 34%. The second one, the Nazis got 32%. They were actually on the decline. But von Hindenburg decided to take a chance on the Nazis, and he, made the, he had them make the government with their 32%. They created a coalition government, and the next thing you know, Europe is burning to the ground. In part, I think nobody thought what they were planning to do, what Hitler spelt out in his book Mein Kampf, what he had said over and over again in speeches, he wouldn't do it. There's no way he's going to actually do it. Why would he do it? This is crazy. And then, of course, he gets into power, and he immediately starts figuring out how he's going to do it. And part of what he wants to do is expel the population of Jews from Europe, get rid of them somehow. Now, he's open to killing them, but it'd be easier to just expel them. So that becomes the process that leads to, first the Jews have to wear an armband that has a Star of David, right? And it, and it builds up. Jewish stores have to mark that they, were, they have Jewish ownership. Part of the process of doing this also has the result of separating the Jewish identity out. Because if you had walked up to those Jewish Germans in 1932 and said, what are you? They would have said, Ich bin Deutsch. It would have never occurred to them to say, Ich bin Jude. Because in their minds, I'm a German. Why are you asking? What's the point in asking this? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm also Jewish. But what does that have to do with me? I'm a German. So by doing this, they're putting this wedge, identity wedge, into the population. They're putting the identity wedge into the non-Jewish population, but they're also putting it into the Jewish population. This is on purpose, because they want to eventually cleave that Jewish population off. Now, there's something completely irrational about doing this, but that's exactly where we were in that moment. And where many of us on the planet are today. Like, when you hear a, a leader in India say, India's for Hindus. Wait, what about the Buddhists and the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims and the Jains and the Sikhs? There's so many other religions in India. How can you say it's for one religion? What happens to them? What's that about? Right? So, <clears throat> to, to advance this a little bit, in September 1st, 1939, Germany attacks Poland. So I'm leaving out a bunch of material to get us to this moment, but I'll cover it in other lectures. Germany attacks Poland. The, brunt, the bulk of the fighting really takes about two weeks. The Germans do a thing called Bewegungskrieg, uh, an English 
There's an English journalist on the ground observing it. He names it Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. And the idea behind it is that not that you fight everything, that you punch holes in the enemy's forces, get behind them, surround them, and then get them to surrender. And then that way you don't have to defeat the whole army. And then you just keep doing that until you get to wherever you're trying to get to. You just keep cutting off chunks of their army and putting them in POW camps. It takes another two weeks or so for Warsaw to fall. So by October, Poland is down. It's taken out. So at that point, the Nazis begin to act immediately. They decide they're going to round up the Jewish-Polish population and ghettoize them. So it's not enough that they're going to ultimately exterminate them. For the first step is that they need to ghettoize them. So Poland uh, gets the misfortune of being one of the countries with the highest deaths in World War II. So right about 65 million people die in World War II. That's like a little bit bigger than two Texases worth of people die in World War II. Um, five million were Polish. So Poland gets the misfortune of being one of the highest countries in terms of death toll, but also percentage of people that dies, right? Soviet Union was number one, and then after that, China, after that, Germany, and then, uh, I can't remember, I think Poland, Indonesia, but it might be the other way around. It might be Indonesia, Poland. They're, they're right about, about the same. So Poland is in third or fourth place, fourth or fifth place. Um, on top of that, the Jewish population in Europe especially gets hammered. There were about 11 million Jews living in Europe. Most people say 6 million Jews died. It's probably 5.1 to 5.4 million. It's in that range. I'm, I'm not trying to do this to downgrade the Holocaust, to be clear. Somebody's going to be like, oh my God, he's a Holocaust denier. I'm doing this because one of the things I've seen is Holocaust deniers uh, focus on the number going, it's an exaggerated number, what else are you lying about? So I, I feel like if you just take that away from them and go with the lower number, the more conservative number, then you don't have to, you don't have to waste your time spinning your wheels arguing about the number. It's just a suggestion to deal with Holocaust deniers, especially because I don't like, emotionally see the difference between 5 million dead and 6 million dead. It really feels like that's just as horrible, especially since it's almost half the population of Jewish Europeans. I, I feel like that's just, an, you don't have to do the exaggeration thing. It's obviously gonna be your choice, but take, take this away from Holocaust deniers is my suggestion. Here's another piece of the tragedy. So, of the 5 million or so, 5.4, as many as 5.4 million Jews in Europe who die in World War II, 3 million were Polish. Of the 5 million Poles who died, 3 million were Polish. In other words, 60% of the Jews who died were Polish, 60% of the Poles who died were Jewish. That weird little numerical thing could also be a mnemonic device, but it also shows that at some level the Holocaust wasn't just a disaster for the Jewish population, it was also a disaster for Poland. In fact, a lot of the Holocaust takes place in Poland, about 60% of it, including the fact that Auschwitz is there. So in a really weird way, Poland becomes ground zero for this nightmare. So when we talk about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, it's not a coincidence that it's taking place in, War in Warsaw, the capital of Poland. So the Germans immediately start acting. I, I'm going to stop doing that. The Nazis, because I kind of feel like it's, you won 32% of the population. There were a lot of Germans who were not Nazis. In fact, there was a huge anti-Nazi resistance movement, including multiple assassination attempts on Hitler. So like, I'll be careful with my language. The Nazis immediately began trying to grab that Polish the Jewish-Polish population and ghettoize it. In the case of Warsaw, they carved out a chunk of the old city right in the middle, and they put 300 to 400,000 Jews into the ghetto. 
<clears throat> the idea being that they'd be confined in a space that's too small. It was about 3.3 square kilometers. So it's a tiny space. There wouldn't be enough sanitation. There wouldn't be enough water. There wouldn't be enough food. And there'd be no real economy. So there'd be no currency coming in. So it would reduce the population to a barter economy where basically everybody is essentially unemployed. And in that way, you could, you could use them as slave labor, basically, in nearby factories if that was a, a thing you wanted to exploit. And then it would also then start to set it up so that you, you could figure out what the Entlösung is, what the final solution is. And of course, a group of Nazis meet in uh, Wannsee. Uh, there's a conference in Wannsee and they try to figure out what the final solution is, and they conclude that the final solution is extermination. Initially, they were trying to deport the Jewish population, but the United States and Great Britain were especially resistant to the idea. Um, Americans were polled. 67% of Americans said they feared that the Jews would come to the United States, and they were actually secretly spies for the Germans, and they would do acts of terrorism and they didn't want that Jewish population coming to the United States. It was to the point where we literally turned around Jewish refugees and sent them back to Europe to die. So after multiple attempts to export the Jewish population, the Nazis decided, all right, we're just gonna kill them off. So the Nazis began creating death camps so this is a good chance to sort of clarify the difference between a, a concentration camp and a death camp. A concentration camp could also be called an internment camp, a prison camp, a slave labor camp. For that matter, you can call it a reservation or a plantation. The idea is you take a population of people and you basically imprison them and you're probably also going to take slave labor out of their, their day, right? Work them in a factory, have them produce something for you. The goal isn't necessarily to kill them, but if they die along the way, you're probably not especially upset about it. You're not torn up. The, the real goal is, is really just to sort of take them out of the general population, isolate them, and maybe extract slave labor. A death camp, your goal is to kill. So the camp is established just for the purpose of exterminating the population of people brought to the camp. Um, the Germans did open up at multiple times six different death camps. They had m multiple concentration camps. Um, Bergen-Belsen was a concentration camp. Dachau was a concentration camp. Auschwitz had a concentration camp and a death camp, so it had both. It had the capability to intern and extract slave labor, and it also had the ability to just, once you arrived, you would be terminated. Once the Germans have decided to go for extermination, they decide to start clearing out the ghettos. So in 1942, um, over the course of about a month, the Nazis show up in Warsaw, the Warsaw Ghetto, and they go, look, we would love to relocate you guys. We get your suffering. This place sucks. We get it. We're conquering the Soviet Union right now, we're tearing it to pieces, it's pretty clear they're going to lose eventually. Here's what we propose. We don't want you here. We don't want you this far west. What we want to do is we want to relocate you and put you as colonists into that Soviet territory where we're going to, we're going to exterminate the po local population there and create a new home for you. And it won't be Europe. Well, it will be. It'll just be far Eastern Europe. And so the Jews began boarding trains to go to these new colonies in 1942. Only there's no new colony waiting for them. They're going to go to Treblinka. And Treblinka is one of the death camps. So in other words, they're going to go through the process that you're probably familiar with, which includes the showers and they're going to be gassed with Zyklon B, and then there's the process of you know, going through the teeth and finding gold teeth, figuring out if you can do anything with the hair and the skin, that horrific, nightmarish hell that the Nazis are going to inflict on that Jewish population. For the record, the Nazis didn't just do this to Jews, they also did this to the Roma, 
also incorrectly known as gypsies, right? They did this to other populations as well, but obviously their hatred and focus was really definitely on the Jewish population. <clears throat> as this is unfolding, um, it becomes clear, somebody leaks it to the, the Jews in the ghetto that they're not going to a colony to be relocated, that they're being killed. By the time the Germans stopped this operation, they, they'd moved out about three quarters of the, of the ghetto. Um, somewhere around 250, 300,000 people had been pulled out of the ghetto. So it had been dramatically shrunk in population. So the Nazis went ahead and actually shrank the ghetto in terms of geography. They got rid of uh, about five sixths of it. Like the, they left just a little piece. And it actually was two separate pieces at that point. When word finally reaches the ghetto at the end of 42, that there was no colony, that there was Treblinka, and they're all going to die, the ghetto leaders go, oh, all right, I'm not doing this. And they decide they're gonna fight. They make the decision. We're, we're gonna fight the Nazis, we're gonna lose, we're gonna be killed. We're not probably even gonna kill that many of them, but at least we're gonna die picking the way we're going to die. At least we're gonna go into this genocide on our own terms. And that becomes sort of the mantra of the ghetto at that point. Um, the leader of the ghetto, I, I, I was trying to remember his name. He was the Jewish leader of the ghetto. When he figures out what's happening, he kills himself. At that point, the two military organizations form inside the ghetto the ZZW and the ZOB. The ZOB was a leftist organization with explicitly socialist goals. It, as a result, was leaning pro-Soviet. The ZZW was pro-Western uh, allies, and uh, as a result, it made direct connection with the Polish Home Guard with the intention that you know, on the other side of World War II, they would work with the Polish Home Guard to make sure Poland didn't end up in the Soviet sphere. Like they're, they're, even though they 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 know they're finished, they're still thinking about the future. They're still making these choices. About 600 ZOB soldiers form up. About 400 ZZW soldiers form up. They make contact with the Home Guard. The Home Guard was really keen to work with the ZZW, so they begin sending in uh, as much as they, can, they think they can afford. And so the ZZW does end up with a, a little bit better armed, a little bit better off than the ZOB. But honestly, both forces were severely underarmed. Like, they did not have enough rifles, they did not have submachine guns, they they had a very few hand grenades. Some of them had Molotov cocktails. Like this is not a well-armed force. The thinking that they're having is as they fight and they die, the soldiers behind them will run up and grab whatever weapons they had. And if they get lucky and kill Germans, they'll, they'll, dis, they'll take the weaponry and ammunition from those Germans. And that's how they'll arm themselves as they fight. Um, the commander, the German commander of, of the Warsaw Ghetto, is ordered to go ahead and start the operations again in January to clean out the rest of the ghetto. They arrive on January 18, 1943. They are SS, so I guess I should explain SS for a second because the Schutzstaffel is kind of a weird organization. Um, when we start doing it in the United States, you'll remember this, this conversation. You'll be like, oh crap, we shouldn't do this, should we? Um, Every once in a while, you see a state do it somewhere on the planet. And you're like, ah, mm, I wish you wouldn't do this. The SS and the SA were paramilitary organizations that the Nazi political party created that were not part of the army. So, so the army was the Hare, H-E-E-R, Hare. The SS were not part of the Hare. They were not army. They were their own private military force. Once the Nazis took over Germany, Hitler and his goons decided that they didn't trust the SA, Stutzabteilung, yeah, Stutzabteilung. So they did the Night of the Long Knives where they actually went in and murdered them at night. 
So one of the paramilitary forces took out the other paramilitary force. The paramilitary force that did the taking out was the SS, Schutzstaffel. They were originally Hitler's personal bodyguard, so he trusted them more than the Sturzabteilung because he saw them as closer to him. So that's why he makes the choice to kill the members of the SA, just to clean up, just to make sure there's nothing coming down the pike. Um, one of the things that the Nazis were really good at was killing each other. They were just, this was like a thing. When you think about it, it's just Darwinism, right? The smartest and backstabbiest will rise slowly to the top. <laughs> it's a great political system. Who came up with this? Ooh, can I be a part? Anyway, so you're constantly looking over your shoulder. In any case, the SS then morphs into two basic organizations. There's Waffen SS, and then the guys who are going to be in charge of the concentration camps. And then later, once they start doing the death camps, the guys that are going to be in charge of the death camps. Now, they're the same organization, it's just they have two wings. So the Waffen SS is a combat force. Leibstandarte is the first of those divisions. They actually made SS divisions. Uh, Leibstandarte is the first. I don't remember all their names. Number five is Viking as in Vikings, uh, and they would, they would take these, you know, they would make these military units. They were, one of the things that you want if you have a good soldier, you want them to be fanatics. You want them to be crazy because crazy people are willing to die. They can't wait to die. They know that dying is the, the path to salvation. And the SS were capable of this, so they were really good soldiers. They were also great at war crimes because they saw their adversaries, especially when they were fighting the Russians, as subhuman. So for them, killing them in a horrible way, shooting prisoners, just wasn't a thing any more than killing a cockroach. Because they had so dehumanized the other side, they saw the other side as cockroaches, vermin that needed killing, animals that needed killing. They're just terrible, horrible creatures. And the world was better off when you killed them. At the end of World War II, there were 7 million dead Germans, 10% of the population. There were 28 million dead Russians. It was one-seventh of the population. Like, the Nazis showed the Soviet Union the stars in the day, and it wasn't because they were looking at the U.S. flag. It was a disaster on an epic scale. 65 million people dead, 28 million of them were Russians. And that was because the Nazis just believed Russians were subhuman who needed killing. That's what drove them to this. So what the, what the Nazis did then is they created a military structure where there was the Wehrmacht, and inside the Wehrmacht were the SS and the Heer, and they were separate. And then that allowed Hitler and the Nazi party to have their own private military force that was not under the control of the army. So in other words, the army had a problem because if the army ever did try to stand up to Hitler, it had this crazy fanatic force on the side. There's at least two people in the room right now who are going, oh my God, my country has this right freaking now. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so. The SS, there's about 800, 900 SS in Warsaw. Their goal is they're underneath the command of the commander who's going to control the, the ghetto and take it out. In addition, the Nazis had about 1,100 auxiliary forces. So some of those were Travniki. So what the Travniki was was uh, Freiwillige Hilfsdienst, I think was their, their crazy name. Um, they were volunteer helper servants or service. They were from the nations that got conquered by the Nazis, and then they, the Nazis went and recruited and said, hey, you're from the conquered nation that we think is subhuman. You want to fight for us? It's not a question. And then they would put them through a training course. So the Travniki were, there was a huge population of Ukrainians, some Poles, they were jammed into this force, and they're there. Uh, the Polish police were there, and they were literally what that is, the Polish police. There were Gestapo as well. Uh, 
the Gestapo or the secret police, the German secret police. So Germany today has like the uh, most anti-state spying laws on the planet because they never want to have another Gestapo. They are completely paranoid by the possibility that at some point something like that could have formed in Germany again. Um, and that's the force that they're going to go into the ghetto with. They arrive on January 18, and uh, the ZZW and the ZOB fight. And the Germans are stunned, right? They're like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> We're just here to round you up and take you to the colony out east. And, and the Jewish resistance goes, screw you, and they fight. The fighting lasts throughout the day. <clears throat> um, multiple Germans were killed. I want to say it was like 12. It's not a huge number by any means. And then, you know, a couple hundred of the Jewish resistance are killed. The, Germ the Nazis were aiming to round up about 8,000 Jews from the ghetto that day. They ended up rounding up about 5,000, but then were in a state of shock because they couldn't believe that this had happened. Ha! <sighs> How are they fighting back? Why are they fighting back? What did, where did this come from? It just completely took them off guard. The guy that was in charge of this was a guy named uh, Saman Frankenegg. He had a hyphenated last name. He will eventually get replaced by another guy named Strop. So Strop um, <clears throat> comes into command. I, I want to say it was April 20th. So Saman Frankenegg is actually the guy who launches the next round of attacks. That happens April 19. It took the Nazis the rest of February and into March and then April. It took them two months to wrap their mind around what had just happened and decide that they were ready to move again. They went in with vehicles and soldiers. Their goal is to round up the remainder of the, of the ghetto. It was probably down to about 50,000 people and finish it off. And they ran directly into Jewish resistance. The Jewish resistance fighters, whether they were the ZZW or the ZOB, did all sorts of crazy heroics. First of all, they had dug tunnels. There were multiple tunnels. I think there were four big tunnels that stretched from inside the ghetto to outside the ghetto so that they could work with the home guard and possibly even get equipment um, food into the ghetto, right? They, they, they were bringing in supplies. They were just walled off. And so the only way to get stuff in and out was through these tunnels that they had built. They also used the sewer system. So these are European style sewers. You can, they're, you know, human height. You can literally walk through them. So they are also walking through the sewers underneath the city. And so between the tunnel system and the sewer system, they had this whole giant underground system, uh, basically fortress and they armed they put whatever arms and ammunition they had in there food supplies in there so that they could operate freely and they just pop up they could pop up through manholes uh Euro european sewers hooked into people's basements so you could you could come out through a basement it was intense on top of this they they built trenches where it was you know there was a place to put a trench they could connect the trenches through basements so that you know, you're not completely on the surface as you're moving through the city. They, they built fortified holdouts, multiple fortified holdouts. They had completely prepared as best as they could for when the Germans arrived to fight. And their goal was to fight to the death because that's all there is. They know that if the Nazis take them to Treblinka, they die anyway. They might as well die here fighting to the death. And the, the Germans can't believe the level of resistance. In fact, uh, in the fighting, they managed to set an armored car on fire, a German armored car on fire, I'm assuming with Molotov cocktails. And they got a German vehicle. The Germans had uh, captured a bunch of French equipment. And they were these Lorraine chassis. They were basically tractors that the French were using to move equipment around for warfare purposes. And the Germans mounted stuff on top of them. Like, for example, the Martyr. They just basically stuck a gun on the top of this thing, and they had a self-propelled gun. I don't know what Lorraine vehicle that the Germans had there. I, I, I'm assuming it's a Martyr. So it was probably just basically a fighting vehicle with a gun on the top. It's not a tank. right? You're, uh, tank, the crew is protected. These guys, the guys are outside loading the stupid thing. Um, 
in any case, whatever, if, whatever the vehicle was, that it ends up on fire. So when the new guy, Strope, takes over, he decides to take the vehicles out of the fighting. He decides that this kind of vehicle fighting in close quarters in a ghetto like this with all these traps laid out, you're just setting the vehicles on fire needlessly. But he also isn't going to show any mercy. He goes in full force day after day after day. They're bringing in artillery. They're, so they're firing uh, into the city. They had anti-aircraft guns that they had brought up. They were firing the anti-aircraft guns into the city. They had howitzers. They had infantry guns that they're firing in. Mortar rounds are going in. And then the Germans were equipped with demolition charges and flamethrowers. So they would just walk into a space, they'd throw the demolition charge, blow it up, they'd come in with the flamethrowers, they're burning the people out. Um, people were hiding in basements, people, right, because you gotta remember, this is civilians mixed with soldiers. There's about 1,000 Jewish resistance soldiers, but there's about 50,000 Jewish civilians around them. And the Germans are trying to round up and take away the civilians, and the soldiers are trying to fight for the civilians. And so it's this mix, and they're going from building to building, from room to room. The Jewish Home Guard, I'm sorry, the Polish Home Guard jumps in, and they actually attack the Nazis from multiple positions outside of the ghetto. And actually, some of the Jewish resistance fighters went through the tunnels and came out and were attacking the Nazis in these outside positions. Like the level of heroics and the level of coordination, considering how little they had and what they were fighting against, was insane. As the fighting went on, the, the ghetto starts to burn because between the flamethrowers and the artillery shells, stuff keeps getting caught on fire and eventually the, the Nazis settle on, this is the way to do this. We'll just flatten the place. We'll just keep setting things on fire. We'll keep demolishing these buildings. We'll bring the rubble down on their heads. We'll kill them that way. In addition to shooting them and fighting them. And so this is how it goes right up until for about 10 days. By about April 29, the ZZW is done. Its commanders are all dead. I think to the last, like they're just finished. Um, they're, or I think one of them escaped, but got captured later. Uh, there, so there, maybe it wasn't hundred percent dead, but it's the commanders are mostly dead. And most of the soldiers are dead at that point. And so the remainder of the ZZW actually got into the trench, uh, into the tunnels and escaped. And they went to go join uh, the Polish resistance. They figured, you know, we can just keep fighting. We don't, there's no point in dying here. The ZOB stays. They're going to fight to the end. They're, they're, they're going to die. And they continue to put up a resistance. Uh, but after April 29, there isn't much left. This, the ghetto's on fire. People are literally suffocating from the smoke. P people are buried in the rubble. There's rotting corpses everywhere. It's a complete hell landscape. In the midst of all of this, even though they're, ho even though they're, they're hopeless, they're still holding out, they're fighting in basements, the, the Nazis are stuck going building to building, even though the, most, the majority of the fighting is over by April 29. So April 30, they're still building the building. Finally, the Nazis get a break on, on May 8. Uh, the address is Mila 18. That was the street. The street was Mila. The street number was 18. That was the building that the ZOB had super fortified. They had done everything they could inside to just make it so that there was no way to capture the building. They had everything they, they could have for one last stand. As the Nazis began to attack the building and it became clear there was no escape and they, they were not gonna win, uh, they, ma they mass suicided inside Mila 18. Um, the commander of the ZOB was a guy named Mordecai Anilovitz. If you look at a picture of more, I, I challenge you to look him up. Mordecai Anilovitz. His nickname was the angel. You look at his face, he looks angelic. It was the perfect nickname for that guy. He looks like an angel. That guy was the mastermind behind the ZOB that put up this incredible fight. And then he, he does end up killing himself on May 8. There's actually eight more days of fighting. By the time the fighting is done, 
the Nazis killed or captured 56,000 Jews. 13,000 dead, 43,000 captured. The estimate is that of the 13,000 that died, probably right about 6,500 actually died from suffocation or rubble collapsing on them. Um, obviously, there was also no water, there was no food, right? So there were other things that could have helped contribute to that 6,500. But suffocation, burning to death, and buildings collapsing on you is probably the bulk of it. Um, the, the remaining 43,000, of course, were sent to Treblinka. And actually, some of them ended up in other places, like they might have ended, some of them ended up in concentration camps or other death camps. What ended up happening was there ended up being multiple uh, more, re more resistance events, for example, at Treblinka. And we believe that it was the survivors of the ghetto that were sent there who actually organized the uprising at Treblinka. So in, it was actually, it turns out, a mistake to send them there because they end up having to replace Treblinka because the Nazis are, weren't one to want the world to completely know what was happening. We did, but we were really good at just going, you know, I don't, I don't see what's happening. Um, on April, actually, I don't know if that's the right day. Uh, in the middle of all of this, there was a Jewish leader in London who was part of the resistance. He was, you know, conveying messages back to Poland and he worked as a representative of the Polish resistance in London. But he, he was Jewish. He kills himself and he writes a note and he said, I cannot stand the fact that the whole world is just sitting there doing nothing while my people are being genocided. I have to kill myself in an act of protest. I should have died next to them, with them. And so he kills himself. Ironically enough, for that 10 days, the first 10 days of fighting, April 19 to April 29, uh, the Allied powers had gotten together to talk about what they wanted to do about Jewish suffering in Europe while the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is just literally burning to the ground. By the time the fighting is over on May 16th, it's leveled. There's nothing left. It's completely gone. Um, Pavel Edelman was one of the ZOB fighter commanders. He's the last of the commanders to survive. He took a group of ZOB out of the out of Warsaw Ghetto through the tunnels like the ZZW had done earlier. And he lived in, I want to say, until 2009, 2010. He, he only passed away recently. And so we, a lot of what we know about the struggle that happened inside the ghetto came from his accounts, uh, his heroic insider accounts of the brutality. <clears throat> and of course, in the end, right, the Allies do stop the Holocaust, but only coincidentally. So even though they had that little conference for that 10 days that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was happening, the Allies never actually actively intervened to stop the Holocaust. The Holocaust does end because Germany is defeated, not because the Allies did something about it. For example, if you look at aerial photographs from the time that were marked up at the time of Auschwitz. I have, I've seen the aerial photograph of Auschwitz. It shows what everything is. Like the showers are labeled, the crematorium is labeled, the platform where the train stopped was labeled. It's all labeled. In other words, our intelligence operatives who were looking at that photograph labeled that photograph so that they could share it with each other to know what was at Auschwitz. In other words, we knew exactly what was happening, but we never once bombed it. We never once bombed at a railroad track going to it. You go, well, if we bombed it, we could have killed them. Okay, what if we bombed the death camp and not the concentration camp? You go, but if we kill them, they're at the death camp. They're, they're already going to be killed. If anything, we might save their lives because as the bombs are dropping, the Nazis are going to be scrambling like rats looking for cover, maybe this gives them a chance to run, to cut through fences, to escape, blow up the train, derail the train on the way to the camp. 
You go, well, some of the Jews will die. Yes, but now they can get out of the boxcars and run into the woods and escape, and maybe the Polish resistance can pick them up. Polish resistance did amazing heroics during this time period. There, there, were, there were actually Polish resistance units that were actively looking for Jews to save their lives. There were Polish resistance units that were doing vengeance killing. They would find Nazis in a vulnerable position and just zap them. They were just trying to kill top-ranked Nazis. There, were, there, there was serious resistance on the ground. We didn't have the ability. We weren't anywhere near Poland. But we did have the air power that we could have made a difference, and we chose not to. We chose to just turn a blind eye and let this happen, which drives me nuts. I want to point that out because that's our habit. When there's a Holocaust on the planet, we just have this tendency to go, I don't want to look. I'm going to ignore it and just walk away. Like, just think of what happened in Rwanda or in Bosnia. And, and we need to stop. It's time for us to become involved as a species with each other's suffering and mitigate each other's suffering. I'm telling this story because I want to remind everybody of the heroics I want to remind everybody of the suffering, and I, w I don't want their story to be lost, right? Mordecai needs to be remembered. That guy was cool, his, and his end sucked. Who knows what he would have become if he could have done something different with his life instead of being stuck. Why? Because he happened to have a different religion? It's bizarre to think that nationalism goes this crazy and classifies people in such a way that you just want to kill. I'm part German. This is a point of shame for me. This is, this is horrible. I'm not part Polish, but I am part German. So this is a point of shame for me. It doesn't mean I have to erase my Germanness. It just means I have to own it. I, I, I'm not going to let the shame move me. I'm going to let the glory of the, the story move me. And I'm going to keep their memory alive so that we can learn from it. We cannot keep doing the same mistake over and over and over and over and over. And over. So it's really weird. We don't learn. Our species sucks. Um, in any case, for the record, most of the Nazis involved in this story, I only mentioned two. I always feel weird about invoking their names because I almost feel like it brings them back to life a little bit. But like I did mention Strop and I did mention Saman Frankenegg. Um, most of the Nazis in this story actually do get it in the end. Um, they're captured over the course of the war. They're tried. Some of them are tried decades later. Some of them are tried at the time. Um, Strop, I, I don't remember if it was Salman Frankenegg or Strop. One of the two is executed. Um, a bunch of them end up in prison for very long prison sentences. Many of them just die in prison. So if you're wondering, like, is there justice? I guess. It's really vengeance, it's not really justice. How do you make that right? right? You know what I mean? Like there's no way to really create a just outcome for what happened. All you can really do at that point is vengeance. And, and I think, uh, hand it to the world, there was a lot of vengeance post-World War II for the, for the perpetrators of this. Um, so if, if that makes you feel any better there, I guess that's my positive note. I, I told you it was gonna end badly. I, uh, because I just don't know how you make this not horrific and not horrible. Oh, I know. I told you a little bit about the Polish resistance. Here, I'll give you a piece. So there was resistance in other countries too. Uh, Bulgaria, for example, and Denmark are, did really crazy, uh, let's, let's save Jew, Jews resistance. Uh, I like what Bulgaria and Denmark both did. So that's it. I'll leave this on a positive note. Bulgaria was a co-belligerent of Nazi Germany. So in other words, Nazi Germany went, will you be our ally? And Bulgaria was like, yeah, I guess. And Nazi Germany said, what do you want? And they go, well, we have a border dispute with Romania and Greece and Yugoslavia. If you solve it in our favor, we'll be your ally. So Germany went, OK. And so Bulgaria got a little bit bigger in World War II and then got shrunk back to its pre-war borders after the war because that was wrong. Bad Bulgaria. Bad. But then at one point, the Nazis go, OK, we want your Jews. 
And Bulgaria goes, Jews? And the Nazis go, yeah, yeah, hand your Jews over. Uh, no, we don't have any Jews. There are no Jews here. Isn't that cool? Because <laughs> there were other countries that were like, yeah, here you go, but not Bulgaria. No, no Jews here. There's nothing to see here. You can come look. And that was it. The Nazis didn't quite get the Bulgarian Jews. In Denmark, the Nazis went, all right, the Jews need to start wearing the armband. The Danes went, oh yeah, of course, we get it. That's your law. We're willing to comply. The next day, the entire country had a Star of David armband on. And the Nazis went, mm. all right, you can keep your Jews, jerks. What are you going to do, kill the whole country? I mean, maybe later, but not at that moment. So there, so there, there's the positive. There were really these, these glorious acts of rebellion and resistance that were dangerous. Uh, oh, there was a, the, uh, the um, top Muslim cleric in Paris. He, I'll give you one more example. Um, when Jewish families would come to the mosque, he would just issue them paperwork making them Muslim. He just gave them Muslim ID cards. And at one point, the Nazis figured out what he was doing, and they came to him and they said, you keep that up, you're going to end up in a concentration camp. He goes, I am so sorry you caught me. I swear I'll never do it again. As soon as the Nazis left. Here you go. You're a Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. And saved a bunch of lives doing that. So, so there, there's the positive. Yeah, that way I don't have to feel bad the rest of the evening. There's even more, but now I'm thinking about it. Raoul Wallenberg. You can even attach names to some of the folks. Wallenberg may have saved hundreds of thousands of people like that. He wasn't just operating on the small scale. He was this rogue Swede who was just basically running around trying to save Jewish lives. Uh, don't worry, he disappeared after World War II. The Soviets captured him and disappeared him. So he was thoroughly punished for his good deed. Uh, there were rumors for decades that he was alive in a gulag somewhere in Siberia but I will probably never really know. Um, it, his mistake, trying to save that last group of people before the Soviet army came, thinking, I guess, the Soviets won't be mean to him. Why were they mean to him? It seems so random and arbitrary. Like, what, what do they care? Enemy of an enemy is a friend. He clearly didn't like the Nazis, so why would you be mad at him? I don't, enemy of an enemy is a friend is an awful saying. Stop believing that it's wrong. But I mean, like, it's not a horrible default setting. I would examine that person, though, more thoroughly. But maybe that's what they did. They were like, just in case, come to the gulag. Let's check you out. Anyway, all right, there. I ended it on a positive note. I promised you not to, but I, I, I want to be done. Do, does anybody have any questions? We can do questions. I don't know where your questions would go, but I'm happy to field them if you have any. <clears throat> no? All right. Yes? That, that the concentration camps and the death camps were... Oh, you mean like the, the German public didn't know? And, just like, and the Polish public didn't know? Oh, and the low-level Nazis didn't know? Okay, yeah. So that's... <laughs> uh, the answer is, yeah, they did. They totally knew. Low-level not low, The German public totally knew. Low-level Nazis totally knew. There was cognitive dissonance operative. So you live in a town. That town, you live in Dachau, let's say. There's a concentration camp there. You can see it. You see the trucks coming. You see the trucks leaving. You know something is going on. And your cousin works there. And your, you know, your cousin's best friend works there. There's no way you don't have an inkling of what's going on. But then you go, it's too horrible to believe. So you delete it out of your brain. What the, what the Nazis did, the Nazis had a problem because what they were doing was so horrific and so horrible, you couldn't just spring it on somebody. You had to ease them in. So what they would do is they would, they would let's say they wanted you to work in the concentration camp at some point down the road. They didn't just bring you and introduce you and put you into the system. 
They would have you do some kind of paperworky job where you were starting to see paperwork coming from the concentration camp. So maybe you were the laundry cleaner for the military or the SS, the laundry cleaner for the SS. And then you see, you know, a laundry list come in from the concentration camp. So you can see the name of the concentration camp in the laundry. And then, you know, the next job you have would get you a little closer and a little closer and they would slowly ease you into. So by the time you're walking through the front gates of the concentration camp, you, you had sort of gotten used to the idea that yes, this is something that's being done. Another thing the Nazis were very careful with is they would weed out sadists. I, I'm doing the pause on purpose because I think the default setting people go to is only a sadist could do this. The Nazis didn't want sadists doing this because the sadist would do it because they liked it, which meant the sadist would be in doing it on the side. The Nazis wanted the leadership to be in total control. They knew the only way you could remain in total control was if you used average everyday people. So Hannah Arendt uh, actually talks about this. She, she coins the phrase, the banality of evil. And what she noticed was, as she did her research, so she was a Jewish scholar, Germ a Jewish German scholar in Germany when Hitler takes power and she actually has to leave the country to, to save her life, right? She ends up in New York. All her works are written in English. She just immediately works her way into the U.S. university system and, and just dumps her Germanness in a way. But at the same time, she's extraordinarily curious about how did this happen? Why did this happen? What went wrong? And what she discovers is how extraordinarily ordinary everybody really was. Like the guy that's working in the concentration camp before the war was a school teacher. It's just a normal guy. And there he is helping genocide. And so one of the things that became this big cultural study after the war was how were people able to deny in their minds to get through their day what was happening just down the road and to ignore it but also, how was it that you could get these normal, average, everyday people into these cruel, sadistic places? And, and they were specifically weeding out the sadists. And so one of the, the, the crazy things about all of this was, yeah, the Nazis did try to hide it, but they failed. In the end, we knew, everybody knew. The reality was the world, the whole planet went, I'm going to pretend, at least for a while, that nothing's going on. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to let it boil over. And that's why the banality of evil became a term, right? Banal means boring. It's common day. That, that the nor this was the norm. These were normal people. There was nothing weird about them. They paid their taxes. They tried to avoid traffic violations. They were good, hardworking everyday folk. And there they were with their little SS bolts on their shoulders and skull and crossbone thing on their caps. I gotta say though, that would have been like, you saw that on the uniform, you'd be like, oh my God, it's like being a pirate. This is probably an amazing recruiting tool. But it also was advertisement for what was coming. <laughs> this was not okay. Um, so yeah, so I think one of the things that Eisenhower did was, because, because so many Germans were like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. What concentration camp? At the end of the war, right? So what Eisenhower did when he freed Bergen-Belsen was he took the people that are living in the area, the Germans living in the area, and he made them go into the camp. He brought them in and he said, look. And of course, at that point, a bunch of them just broke down and began weeping because their cognitive dissonance got broken. There was no way to deny it anymore. They knew all along. They had just put it in their brain, in a, like a closet in their brain, and then closed the door and locked it. And being inside Bergen-Belsen broke that. I, I went to Dachau. I'm good. I'll, I'll never go to another one of these again. Like, I don't, I, I have a friend who's like, I want to go to Auschwitz. I don't want anything to do with it. Dachau 
freaking freaked me out. It was so horrific. Like I was weeping the whole time. I didn't see anything anyway. So what was the point in being there other than to say you were there? Um, the, the level of evil that was done was, was that horrible that I get it. I get the cognitive dissonance. How can you believe that your friend is doing this? How can you believe that your cousin is doing this? How can you believe that Germany was doing it? It's just too horrible. There's no way. Free yourself of cognitive dissonance. Just go ahead and accept the facts and then act on them. We're on a planet where this stuff is happening right now as we speak. Like this isn't just the past. There have been recent events, there are current events, there will be future events. It's time for us to just go into it and go, okay, this is the reality. Now let's, let's face it, let's address it, let's confront it. By the way, uh, it's not just cruelty in the Holocaust or genocidal level, there's the cruelty of ignoring global warming for that matter, or the cruelty of ignoring a rising debt that spiraled out of control. There are lots of ways in which we're cruel to each other, but this is the, the really brutal stuff. Um, I don't know if I adequately answered your question, but yeah, I think the, there was widespread knowledge. Anyway, any other questions? All right, take care.